come unto me, and I will give you rest. Rest is an easy word. If you think about it, it has many dimensions. Sometimes you lay in bed at night and you want to rest. You want to sleep. And if you don't sleep, you feel like you haven't had rest. But when Jesus said, come unto me, he had something very deep and different than that in mind. When Matt read the scripture from Psalm Psalm 95. I don't know if you listened carefully enough. Some of you said amen when he was done, and maybe you just meant amen when you're reading the scriptures. But when he closed, verse 11, it's God said, uh, you cannot have my rest. Did you notice that? He swore in his wrath, you shall not enter into my rest. Did you catch that? You're not talking to me. Now, interestingly enough, uh, that text is quoted in the book of Hebrews. I'd like you to turn there with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 3. It's almost word for word. In fact, you probably know that the Old Testament that the disciples had to read was actually in Greek. So sometimes when you read something in the New Testament, it's quoting the Old Testament. It doesn't sound exactly the same. That's because it's gone through a translation. But in any case, uh, I'm going to read to you, read with you, something that Paul said here. I want you to get a picture now of the timeline. Uh, David wrote that psalm. David lived about 1,200 years before Christ was crucified. And now uh, the author of Hebrews, we actually don't know for sure who wrote it. Most of us think it was probably Paul. I, I won't get sidetracked. It's an interesting story. But the writer of Hebrews wrote this perhaps 40, 50 years before after, you know, A.D. So uh, 12, 1,300 years has gone by. And notice what Paul, I'm just going to say Paul every time I'm referring to it, says. Verse 7. Interestingly enough, it's the same verses, 7 through 11, just by chance in terms of the way the people who put the verses together. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost said... Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works 40 years. Look at that phrase, in the provocation. It's referring to the fact that the Israelites kept provoking the Lord. Y'all with me on that? The Bible calls it the provocation. How long did the provocation last? What does it say here? 40 years. And what Paul is saying and what, what David was inspired to write, please notice, however, I, I didn't mention this. In verse 7, Paul is writing, as the Holy Ghost said, What's he mean by that? He means that when David wrote this, the Holy Ghost was inspiring him to write it. Are you with me on that? And so Paul is repeating it, and he's appealing to his people to, to, to do not what? To do not harden their hearts as they did in the provocation. And after reading those verses, 7 through 11, well, it, just, to, just to repeat it, notice verse 10. Who's speaking here when it says, wherefore I was grieved with that generation? This is God speaking. He was heartbroken. He was, if you will, angry. And he said, they make, they, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, they are making mistakes in their heart. Now, of course, that's a metaphor for their mind. And what's worse is, folks, listen to what it says there. They have what? 
these people don't even understand, God is saying, what I'm trying to do. Got that? Is that an indictment? That's incredible, folks. These are his people. Is there a possibility that this could apply to you or to me? Please say yes. And you can tell that by what Paul then says. Verse 12. I'm sorry, I should have emphasized verse 11 a bit, a little bit. Because the people did not understand what God was doing, what did he say to them? You cannot have rest. And he's saying, my rest. My topic this morning, folks, I want you to deal with me. What is, what is my rest? What is God really talking about? All right? Then he says, take heed, brethren. You can say brethren and sisters lest there be in any of you an evil heart of what? Unbelief. By the way, the word, the Greek word that's translated faith or belief is exactly the same. It's just up to the translator whether they're going to write faith down or belief. It's the very same word. And uh, I could give you the Greek word. I won't bother you with that. If you just put an A in front of it, it means unbelief or unfaith. Y'all with me on that? We do that in the English language, don't we? We put an A in front of something, and uh, it can mean the opposite of what the word was before. So then he is counseling them. He says, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, what does exhort mean? Encourage, uh, give instruction, uh, help, exhort one another every day. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. While it was said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. Paul is writing this to the Israelite people uh, after Christ's crucifixion. But of course, he's referring to the experience that the people had in the wilderness. In fact, if you read on there, notice something. Verse, eight, uh, verse 16. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. He's talking about the Israelites. God speaks to them, mainly through Moses. Once in a while, there's some thunder that's God's voice. And uh, he said, some people, when they heard that, provoked God. How be it not everyone, this is not all in my Bible, that came out of Egypt by Moses. Can you tell me who it was that did not provoke God during those years? How many people? Two people out of a million? Two people. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Verse 17. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not, or you might say he will not let them have rest. Verse 19. So we see the problem is, I'm paraphrasing, they could not enter in because of what, friends? Because of unbelief. This is a strange situation because everybody in this room actually does, probably everybody, believe God. Isn't that right? There probably aren't many people in here that are not believers in God. So something's going on here, folks, that's much deeper than just believing there's a God. Are you all with me on that? And God, Jesus himself, and now in the, in the New Testament, is calling it an experience of what he is calling rest. 
Now, when the Israelites were taken uh, from bondage in the Exodus, uh, it's mentioned in the Old Testament. I won't take the time to read these. I'm just referring to, your, to, your, to the story. God wanted them to have rest. And uh, it's described in the Old Testament as, um, especially, folks, especially after camping for 40 years. Anybody in here like to camp? You know, one time my wife and I took our two daughters on a camping trip in British Columbia. It's so far from here, you may not have heard of it. Anybody, <laughs> anybody ever heard of the Bowerin Lakes? See, not a, a one hand. Well, about 500 miles north of the border, north of the Canadian border in British Columbia, there are tw 21 lakes, roughly in a rectangle. And it is a provincial park. In this country, we call it a national park. You go up there, and you park your car, and you get your canoe, and you put it in the first lake. And you paddle down that lake a few miles, and then you get out and carry all your stuff uh, a ways to the next lake. And you do this for almost 100 miles. And uh, it's, it was, you talk to our girls. We, we, we did things with them, many, hundreds of things with them through the years while they were growing up. And they will tell you that was the greatest thing we ever did. We've taken a number of canoe trips where we went camping. But here we were for 10 days. I'll tell you what, folks. I was ready to go back to my bed after 10 days. <laughs> Are you all with me on that? And uh, 40 years camping. Every time the cloud moves, I don't think the people were that excited when the cloud started to move because they had to pack up their tents, pack up their belongings, get their animals together, travel to some new place, and dig new latrines, and on and on it goes. For how many years? Now, it was God's plan that they would get this done in a couple of weeks. You understand that? Have we been on this earth longer than we should have been before he returns to give us the rest? Actually, he's going to give us that rest before he returns. In fact, we can't have that rest until we have it here. What the rest meant to them was several things, some physical things. They were going to have a home instead of a tent. Do you think that would be good news? Sure. They were going to have gardens. It was God's plan to stop the manna and let them raise their own food, which would be a wonderful thing. They were going to have freedom from their enemies. There's songs about going to war no more. That was the physical aspect of the rest. But I would like to suggest this morning that uh, it's a deeper issue, and I want you to plumb that with me. Part of this rest, in fact, I suppose the fundamental issue in this rest from a physical standpoint was that the people would obey God. Are we called to do that today? Sure. Do all of us try to do that? Yes. Do some of us fail? Yes. I'll take my place at the head of the line if you like. This is connected, folks, with uh, Exodus 19. Don't turn there, because I want to keep moving quickly, but I'll, you'll, you'll, you all know this. Uh, Moses went up into the mountain. This is before the Ten Commandments were given. And God had him write in a book many uh, directions, many, I hate to call them rules, but many, many ways that God wanted them to live. And Moses came back down the mountain and read that book to the people. What did they say? 
Oh, you all know this. All that the Lord has said we will do. Did they mean that? Some of you said yes and no. I don't know. I think they meant it. I think they meant well, folks. Don't you mean well every day when you get up to go out and live and you don't want to do wrong? Don't you mean well? Sure. You make mistakes. And it's heartbreaking, isn't it? Because you don't want to do that. I think they meant well. They didn't know themselves, did they? You just go a few chapters later, and they're worshiping a golden calf. It's unbelievable, folks. Now, you and I have never worshiped a golden calf. Is it possible that we have worshiped some things? Is it possible that we still worship some things? You know what one of my big problems is? I would rather fly an airplane than eat food. Is there any man or woman, I suppose, in here that understands what I'm talking about? Is there no pilots in here? Uh, could that become a god to me? Of course. Is there a pretty high risk it become a god to me? You all with me on that? And... Uh, this is the kind of thing, folks, that is very difficult for us to really realize. And one of the reasons that God lets us have problems is because it makes us take stock and think about what it might be that's standing in the way. You all with me on that? My prayer for myself, my prayer for you this morning. This church is embarking on a precious effort to reach this community. Is that right? Do you suppose that in any of our lives there are or is some or one idol standing in the way? I don't see too many heads nodding. You think that you and I ought to give some serious consideration to that? Please nod your head for that. Now, um, The Israelites meant well, I believe. They wanted to do what God wanted to do. And by the way, this agreement between the Israelites and God in Exodus 19 is what is referred to in the Bible as the Old Covenant. That was its origin. Now, if you'll turn with me, in fact... Uh, I almost changed my sermon this morning because of where the Sabbath school teacher was going. <laughs> but if you'll turn with me to uh, chapter 8, just a couple of pages further over in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> let's, let's begin with verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, speaking of Jesus, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. I'm tempted to ask you a question here. So this better covenant, which is going to be established upon better promises, who makes the better promises? Did I hear some of, several of you say God did? I'd like to suggest to you that God promises were, God's promises were perfectly adequate in Exodus 19. And they're still perfectly adequate in Hebrews chapter 8. The problem was the promises that the people made. Are you all with me on that? Even though they meant well? For if that first covenant, now that's referring to, Hebrews, uh, to uh, Exodus 19. If that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second or for another, if you wish. And what is the first phrase in the next verse? Who had the fault? It was the people. Is that correct? 
The fault, folks, was not with God. Are you with me on this? The fault was the people. Now, God is merciful. Aren't you thankful for his mercy? And even though I make mistakes every day, he is very anxious to forgive me. But the fault was with the people, friends. Not with God's promise, but with the people's promise. Even though they meant well. And you and I do too, don't you? I prayed this morning, Lord, I want to do your will. And I mean that with all my heart. But before the day is over, I may well make a mistake. In spite of the fact that I want so much to cooperate with his plan. For finding fault with them, he said, notice what he says, Behold, the days come when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because what? They continued not. And this is kind of a sad part, folks, when it says, I regarded them not, saith the Lord. What happens, folks, when I make a mistake? Until I recognize it and ask him to forgive me, I'm on a kind of some dangerous ground. Would you agree with that? The Bible said, the, Paul writes here, God did not regard them. Of course, they had this rebellious attitude, and I don't have that, and I don't think any of you have, so be careful of how you deal with this. If you're not in rebellion, and you've made a mistake, I don't think this applies. God does not regard you. But uh, in any case, it's a very serious thing uh, that I need to be aware of and make sure my heart is not rebellious. Verse 10. <clears throat> this is the covenant I will make. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds. This is just a repetition in their mind and their hearts means the same thing. Now, this is kind of an aside, but uh, many Christian friends of mine uh, believe that the Old Covenant was God's Ten Commandment laws and that the Old Covenant has been done away with. That part is true. The Old Covenant, God wants to do away with. Are you all with me on that? But the new covenant, if you, if you just read this, it's the same law that's being written in the heart that was written on stone. Correct? It's the same law. And the metaphor is when it's written on the heart, and that is a metaphor, is that not correct? He wants that to become such a part of my being that... Uh, I can do what he wants. And we're coming to that part here uh, momentarily. I want you to turn with me to um, Galatians chapter 4. And if, do we have pew Bibles? I don't think we have pew Bibles in the chairs. I really wish you all could have a Bible in your hands and look at this carefully with me. <clears throat> Let's look at Galatians chapter 4 and verse, verse 24 and verse 22. I'm happy to hear those pages turning. And I'll read when you're there. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a bondmaid, and the other by a free woman. Thank you. I think you're all familiar with this story. Uh, it was spoken of this morning in the Sabbath school class that Abraham and Sarah were barren, we, we tend to say. And God had promised in Genesis 12 that Abraham would have, a, have great nations from him. And here he was uh, finally 
uh, 99, uh, and Sarah was uh, 10 years younger, and they still hadn't had a child. Um, but then, uh, and before this, as you know, the first son that was born, uh, Sarah, you can't imagine this today. I can't imagine any woman coming to her husband and saying, well, I haven't been ab able to have a child. Why don't you marry another woman and you can have a child? You women probably, but of course, things were different in those days, perhaps. But that's what she did. And uh, you all know the story. Abraham agreed. And, and Abraham, and uh, help me say her name, Hagar had a child. And Abraham thought that that was the promised child. Very interesting story. And uh, it says here that the other that one of the sons was by, was by this bond maid, and the other by a free woman. Now notice verse twenty three. This is really remarkable, folks. He who was born of the bond woman, what was the name? Hagar was the name, but the son's name was Ishmael. He was born, watch the phrase, after the flesh. But he of the free woman was born by promise. In other words, friends, the second child was a miracle child. It says in Hebrews 11, Verse 11, listen to this. Through faith, Sarah herself also, watch the next word, received strength. How did she get that strength? By believing, by having faith, and was delivered of a child, I'm reading on now, and was delivered of a child when she was past age. That meant she was postmenopausal. She shouldn't have been able to bear a child. So this child, folks, was the result of a miracle. Are you all with me on this? After the flesh um, means the normal procreation process. But this child was by promise. Notice verse 24. This is amazing, friends which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants. These what? These boys, or really their births. The old covenant is represented by the birth of Ishmael. After the flesh. Um, I'm going to be very careful with my language here and delicate, but there are some interesting parts here. Um, to the casual observer, would the process of impregnating Hagar and impregnating Sarah been the same? I see a puzzled look on a few faces. Do I need to be more specific, or shall I just say it again? The process of impregnant, imp, impregnating, imp, imp, <laughs> impregnating to the casual observer now, people don't observe this. You understand? I understand that, but I want you to put this in your mind. It would have appeared the correct. The point here, folks, is this. To the casual observer, obedience to one of God's laws first of all could be by if you will, human effort or after the flesh. Or it could be, listen to this, folks. This is the critical issue in this whole story. It could be that that obedience was by a miracle. You get the point? 
to the casual observer, it might look the same. Correct? This matter of doing something that God wanted you to do. You all with me? Which is, I, this is too cheap of a word, but it's tricky. Because you can do something in your own strength, or if you will, after the flesh. And I'm going to use a double negative. I apologize. It, it is not without benefit. Let me give you an example. Suppose that you uh, decide to rest one day a week, maybe because you read about it in the Bible. Refrain from work, and spend the time in ministry, or spend the time in fellowship with God or his people. Could you do all of that in your own strength? Please talk to me. Yes. Would there be some benefit? Yes. Would that be God's plan? No. You with me? I won't speak for you. I think there are plenty of times when I'm doing something right, if you will, in my own strength. The true rest is that it is God's power and not yours. You still with me? When I do something right, when I refrain from wrong and do right, Lights on. Now I lost my place in my Bible. And by the way, Jesus never used his own power. You know this. John 5, verse 30. I can of my own self do he said, I think it's in John 15, I don't even speak my own words. Isn't that correct? I just speak the words that my Father gives me. Folks, that is the plan that God wants you and me to find. And I realize that's not simple. That is a walk with him. That is a walk with him unlike which most of us yet have. Is that correct? But don't be discouraged and don't give up. One step at a time. One little victory, if you will. How do you make it God's power instead of your own? Is that a good question? It's the choice of the will, friends. Lord, I want to do your will because of your indwelling presence. You don't have to use those words, right? And when you, when, when you make that Choice, folks, when that, when that is, and you know this, that that thought is supposed to be lingering in my mind all the time. I have a really neat illustration for that. I don't know if this will work for you. It, I think it should. Uh, when I was in college, I was working on three majors, physics, mathematics, engineering, and theology. Don't you think I'm smart? Among my peers, I was at the bottom of the totem pole. 
I realize my peers are way above average, and maybe I'm a little above average, but I want you to understand, folks, that I had all kinds of friends. They could get this stuff. They could get, uh, it was just incredible. But uh, for me, you can't know the hard work. I remember one day I'm sitting there studying advanced differential equations. You don't even know what differential equations are. I bet some do. Who, who know? One hand, two or three. Yeah. A miracle. <laughs> I can remember sitting there and just, I don't know how to describe it except breaking my brain to try to understand this stuff. But you know what? And I, the only way I can describe it is somewhere back here. There's something floating around that doesn't disappear, even though I'm breaking my brain on this stuff. You know what it was? It was Neva. We were engaged. At the end of that year, we were to be married. I had a job teaching already in uh, Tennessee that I had agreed to uh, uh, fulfill. And um, it was my love for her, my interest in her, my desire for her. And in, in a way, folks, it never left my mind. Does that make any sense? Gentlemen, you're not shaking your head, are you? Are you nodding your head? OK. For a minute, it looked like he was shaking his head. And uh, my fellowship with Neva, we were on the phone. I don't know if we were on the phone every day, and, uh, but we would see each other. And I, I wanted to see her every day. Can you relate to that? And she, amazingly enough, wanted the same for me. Do any of you men think about your wives? And you, you shake your head and you think, boy, she really, I don't know why she likes me. You understand what I'm talking about, sort of, gentlemen? <clears throat> so you know this, folks. It's time on your knees. It's time in the Word. It's time in talking with our Father and His Son that keeps that awareness in my, if you will, subconscious all the time. Right? Right? The true rest, let me repeat it, is that when I obey, it's his power and not mine. Now, follow me carefully, friends. This is the reason why it is not legalism for God to require obedience. Please listen to that carefully. The Christian world thinks Adventists are legalists because we believe the church has always taught folks that obedience is required. I say the church. Jesus taught it, didn't he? All over the Bible he taught this. The problem is that many of us, and I'll take my place at the head of the list, meaning well, we go out and do what we're supposed to do in our own strength. Fair enough? I'm glad God is merciful, and he... And he uh, is patient, but it needs to be part of my conversation with him, folks, every morning, every evening, throughout the day. Uh, Lord, I want to be connected with you. There's all kinds of words you can use, folks, but it all amounts to the fact that in my mind, I want his way, I want his life in me, and I want to cooperate with him in every way. And when I have that, when that is in my mind, that that's what I want, when I do right, folks, it may look like to the casual observer that I did it by my strength, but the Bible says it was by promise. Amen? Now, I'm going to dare to touch a topic that is somewhat delicate, so I'm going to have to speak in careful words because of young ears. 
have you ever wondered why in the world removing a little skin from a male organ is a symbol of being one with Christ? Please say yes, you've wondered. Here's the reason. In the scriptures, oftentimes a part represents the whole. And God is saying, and of course the Israelites, I'm sidetracking here, the Israelites got all mixed up on this and they became proud if they were circumcised. It's the opposite. It, what God is saying is, I don't need this in order to make a baby. You with me? You're not nodding. You understand what I'm saying? God says, I can produce a, ma a baby with a miracle. Is that right? That's the meaning of circumcision, friends. It's the same thing I've been talking about for 30 minutes. It is that God wants our obedience to be the result of a miracle of his indwelling power. I bet most of you never knew that about circumcision. Am I right? Amazing story. You've been sitting around all these years wondering why in the world, and that's the reason. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for this plan you have. And I think all of us realize, folks, that we fall short of it, perhaps somewhat frequently. But what a plan, Lord, and we want to cooperate. I think I speak for everybody in this room. We want to have this walk with you this wonderful rest because it's your power and not ours. Amen. Now, my wife will remonstrate with me, fortunately, uh, if I don't remind you of something else that you need to read here. If you're back in the book of Hebrews, please. This will be chapter 4. Um, I am very grateful for this woman, folks, because she is willing to speak to me about a message I present when it wasn't sufficient. Actually, I've left out a section here that I... <sighs> Let's just take another couple of minutes and read in chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. Verse 3. For we which have believed, or have faith, do, I'm going to paraphrase, do have the rest. We enter into the rest. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day like this. I'm paraphrasing a bit. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. But, that would be a proper translation for the word and, but in this place again, and I'm sorry that in the King James it's not, it's not translated quite like it should be, they shall not enter into my rest. Please follow. I'm sorry I'm going to go on here for a couple of minutes if you don't mind. Please get the point. Uh, God is saying, you can't have my rest. Seeing therefore, verse 6, it remains that some must enter therein, that is, into the rest. And they to whom is first preached entered not because of what? So in verse 7 he says, he, again, he offers, uh, David offered this after so long a time. If you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That's what we read in Psalms 95. Now notice this. It says, for if Jesus had given them rest, it really should say Joshua. Jesus' name and Joshua's name are the same. Did you know that? Joshua. And the idea here, who took the people into the promised land? Joshua did. Did they have rest when they got there? Say no. Isn't that correct? They had not found the true rest. Isn't that correct? That's what, what Paul is writing here. If Joshua, I'm going to add two words in there so you'll get the force of it. If Joshua had been able to give them rest, then God would never have had uh, David have to write 
didn't David come along after the Israelites were in Canaan? If they had found true rest, the Holy Spirit would never have had David say what he said about them being obstinate and not having true rest. Are you all with me on this? That's what this verse is talking about here. For if Joshua had been able to give them rest, then would God not afterward have spoken of another day through David? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Now, many Adventist evangelists, and it's okay, I won't fault them. I want to tell you that this is not talking about Sabbath keeping. This is talking about the true rest. Are you all with me? Of which Sabbath keeping is a symbol. You following me? I'm an old teacher, folks. If you don't tell me with your face that you're getting it, it makes me feel like I didn't do a very good job. And one real good way is to nod. Are you with me that they, the true rest, they didn't get that? So uh, it had to be repeated by David a couple, about 200 years later. Verse 9, there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, you know, if you or if I am entered into his rest, I have ceased from what? My own works. Now notice the next phrase. Just like God did from his. So the reference is back to there where, where it says he rested on the seventh day. This passage is not about Sabbath keeping. It's related to it for sure. This passage is about the true rest where it's God's power, I'm repeating myself, and not my own. Verse 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And by the way, just for the sake of a little bit of interest, in verse 9, there remaineth, therefore, a rest, the word there is sabbatismos. That's the Greek word. That is not the word for Sabbath. The word for Sabbath is sabbaton. And when you're a student and you are trying to understand the text, what would be the normal thing to do when you see a word that you're not familiar with, which sabbatismos to the average person? I studied Greek for two years. Every day we had to come to class with a pretty significant portion of the New Testament translated. And guess what? Even though I have uh, uh, vo the vocabulary cards, you know, you, one side is English and one side is Greek, uh, every once in a while, guess what I run into? A word that I don't remember what it means. Y'all with me on this? So here comes a word that actually is quite unusual. Sabbatismos. It's translated in the King James as rest. And if you're a scholar or just a student of the word and you're using concordances, what are you going to do if you see this word that you're not familiar with? Let me just tell you what you're going to do so I can make this go quicker. You're going to see how else Paul used that in other places. Are you all with me on that? He didn't use it anywhere else. So then what are you going to do? You're going to see how other Bible writers use that word. Correct? Nobody did. What do you do then? You go to the classical literature in Greek and see how people use sabbatismos. Are you all with me on this? Nobody ever used it. It's non-existent. Paul made this word up. What do you do then? You use the context. The context here is rest. Amen? Context is rest. And uh, the King James did a pretty good job. There remaineth a rest. Actually, the New King James and most of the new translations put in there, and Adventists like this, but it's not quite correct. There remaineth the Sabbath rest to the people of God. Are you aware of that? That's in, in the newer translations. This is not talking about Sabbath keeping. Sabbath keeping is a beautiful symbol, folks, of the true rest. I'm repeating myself. It illustrates how taking time 
away from the average stuff is such a blessing to us. Isn't that correct? Sure. One day I was preaching this very sermon at a camp meeting not too long ago. And uh, a lot of people there, a thousand probably, and uh, people were coming up and talking to me. And here came an older man, quite older. Uh, I didn't recognize him. And uh, I had been waxing eloquent on the Greek, right? And uh, he walked up to me and he said, I appreciate what you said. And I didn't recognize him. And suddenly he told me, he says, I'm Dr. Litke, my Greek teacher from college. <laughs> I'd like to take 20 minutes telling you about this man. I'm going to do it in 30 seconds. He's probably the finest linguist that this church has ever produced. Maybe with, uh, help me say the name of the author of the last Sabbath school quarter, dear. Our friend, um, yeah, anyway, uh, he knew a dozen of these ancient languages. And uh, it's fabulous to sit at his feet. But the beautiful thing was, he said, I agree with you. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let's, let's do this, folks. Would you take just a moment to pray? And my, my suggestion is, tell the Lord how much you want to have and keep this experience. I'll wait about 20 seconds, and then I'll say a very brief prayer and close. Oh, Neva's telling me I forgot the one verse that I'm supposed to read to you. I'll go back to Hebrews 3. I'll, thank you, dear. You, you blame her for this long sermon now, not me. <laughs> verse 12. Thank you, sweetheart. For the word of God is quick. What does that mean, quick? Living, living power. It's powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the divining asunder of soul and spirit. And that's like an impossibility is the, is the idea there. And uh, the dividing asunder of the joints and marrow, which again is an impossibility in the sense and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Folks, this word, when I take time with it every day, will help me see where my heart is in this whole matter of the true rest. Does that make sense? It is God's word. Take the time to memorize this book. I don't want to embarrass my wife. She's memorized the whole book of Revelation. And when she did that, I, I began to become, what's the word? Yeah, besides envious, what's the, what's the, what's the bad word? They're like, Je jealous, jealous. So I memorized the first 15 chapters. This was 25 years ago. And uh, that was fun. We were in evangelism. We'd be driving across the country, and we'd re we would repeat a, repeat a chapter back and forth to each other as you go through the book. And, and, uh, but listen, folks, uh, take the time. Isn't that the issue? Take the time. Make the decision. Have the decision be just floating back around there. Lord, I want to do your will and your power. And folks, God will give you power to touch hearts around you. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this precious church family here today. I presume, Lord, we're all in great need of this experience. Please bless us, Lord, as we labor, as it says there, labor to enter into that rest. Bless us this week in a special way, Father, in Jesus' name.